morning members, um, for those of you who may have seen in the chat, we're um, awaiting our BSL um, interpreter. Um, so we're... Pro oh. Morning, Georgina. Hi, uh, sorry about that. Thanks very much. Um, so we're now not going to adjourn, so um, <laughs> all's good. Good morning, members, and welcome to this meeting of the Finance, Procurement and Transformation Committee. This morning, we've only been able to secure one BSL interpreter, so further to consult in with Councillor Dennerley, I would propose subject input from our interpreter, Georgina, that every 20 minutes we adjourn for 10 minutes to allow both to take a short break, as interpreting in this way is very intensive. This meeting has been live streamed and recorded and will be made available for viewing through our Council's website. Remote participants, please follow the good practice guidance, which includes muting microphones and switching off your video when you're not addressing the meeting, writing speak in the Teams chat function when you want to contribute. If you're in the hall, you can do this on your iPhone or iPad. Please don't repeat contributions already made by other members. No materials should be posted in the chat function if it is intended as part of the discussion. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by roll call. If any member has to leave the meeting, please either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time or write leave in the Teams chat function and then join when you rejoin the meeting so we can keep track on whether the meeting is coded. All members should speak clearly and directly into the microphone when making contributions and when referring to reports, please provide reference to the relevant page and paragraph to allow everyone to follow. Please focus contributions on areas where clarification is required or to propose an alternative to a recommendation. We have several important reports to consider today and I anticipate we will deal with the business in our usual efficient manner. Item one, Seridan, apologies, and Chair's removal of members' report remote participation. Nick, can you provide the Seridan and any apologies, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, we've had two apologies, um, one from Councillor McCammon, the other from Councillor Thompson. We have nine members present in the chamber and nine, mes nine members present on teams. One member not present at the start of the meeting, Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, Nick. I approve of members' rem remote participation. Moving on to declarations of interest, do any members have any declaration of interest they wish to make? Councillor Hagman. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. Um, so in terms of items four, five, six and seven, it's just to note my national role as Cosler Resources spokesperson. And there's, there's an implied involvement with that role regarding pay negotiations, fiscal flexibilities, the revenue settlement and lobbying. However, as these are done at a national level, I don't believe that they would preclude me from taking part in the local discussions here, but I just wanted it noted. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the minute of the previous meeting of the 8th of November 2022. Can we note the minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of November 2022? Councillor Campbell. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, page 12, uh, the noted uh, and agreed on item 5, 5.5, uh, 5, it was agreed that a report outlining measures that could be taken to reduce the Council's energy and fuel consumption will be brought to the next meeting of Economy and Resources. I don't think I've seen a paper on Economy and Resources, but hopefully we can get that paper maybe at the next one. Thanks. Morning. Thanks, Councillor Campbell. It was actually brought to the November meeting of ENR. If you recall, the FPT meeting was delayed because of the um, passing of the Queen, and we, the report was brought forward afterwards. So I think the, the words within that are not correct, and we can clarify that within the text of the minute. 
Thanks, Chair. Happy for these uh, to be approved. Thank you. Moving on, item number four is the local government finance settlement for 2023-24 to 24 and the impact of, on the financial strategy report by Head of Finance and Procurement. This report provides members with updated information on the Council's overall budget position following the announcement of the local government finance settlement for 2023-24. I would draw members' attention to the updated funding gap for 2023-2024 based on the assumptions in the budget model, which is estimated at £12.989 million. The finance settlement has been described by COSLA as completely unacceptable and is a real terms cut to the Council's core funding. I am deeply concerned, as I am sure all members are, that this settlement does not take into account that many of our residents are struggling with the impact of rocket and prices of food, fuel and other bills and are facing unprecedented levels of poverty. This budget settlement will have a detrimental impact on our vital services and on our ability to focus the necessary resources and support for our residents who are already impacted by this cost of living crisis. We should continue to support the causal lobbying position that is held by all 32 local authorities. Paul Garrett and Gillian Ross are here to assist if any members have any questions and I'll open the meeting up to member debate. Councillor Campbell. Yeah, thanks, Chair. J just for a wee bit of clarity on page 21, we've got the table there. We've got the uh, amounts from the national funding and uh, there's a couple of the, uh, the real living wage, for example, uh, not distributed yet, but we know what the national funding is. I'm just wondering, do we have a ballpark figure for that and also the discretionary housing payments? Do we have a, a ballpark figure? Thanks, Chair. Julian. Um, the, the details for the, the real living wage um, are subject to discussion at the moment with the settlement and distribution group. We do normally receive just over 3%. Um, for uh, the health and social care element there. In terms of the discretionary housing payments, we tend to receive the same share each year. Um, so it was about £1.5 million. They distribute about 90% up front, and then they, they distribute the, the, late, the lesser 10% later on the year, depending on the number of claims. So I would anticipate that we should receive round about that level again. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Hislop. Thank you, Chair. It's just, is there any idea when we might get a settlement with the Teachers Pay Award? Because we could be looking at a significant increase uh, in cost to the Council with the pay increase. And is there any word that maybe there'll be money coming from the government to meet some of that increase? Um, I think there was a thing came through some of the auditors had found two, mil two billion, I think it was, that hadn't been spent uh, from the government. I uh, saw that online, but maybe that was just figures picked out of the air somewhere. But, uh, you know, if there's money available, is there anything coming for this that we could actually benefit from? Because it could be quite severe if it's a, a reasonable settlement with the... Uh, unions get and it could open up the other uh, negotiations again for this year and it could you know cost us quite a bit of money Paul at, at this stage we're not anticipating any additional Scottish government funding to support an enhancement to the, the teachers pay offer the the additional monies that the Scottish government provided in the summer uh, when there was wider uh, industrial disputes that was to cover the whole government workforce so that included teachers so that's allowed uh, the teachers to receive this, the same pay offer as was accepted by the non-teaching workforce so obviously the teaching workforce has, has rejected that at this stage so uh, the Scottish Government have indicated that there is no additional money likely to be made available to support enhancement to that, that offer so we're not anticipating anything at this stage and as you've said the real risk is that if specific arrangements were made for, for the teaching workforce that may lead to an opening up 
of the negotiations that have previously been been settled for the, the wider workforce. So that's something we're keeping a, a close eye on at the minute. And given the size of the pay bill, as you say, is a significant risk. But as far as we understand at the minute, the Scottish Government is indicating that no additional funding is likely to be made available to support the teachers' pay deal at this stage. Councillor Young. Hey, thank you, Chair. On page 21, 3.13, as we know, an enormous amount of money is delegated annually to the Integrated Joint Board. In this case, it's £100.6 million. Hey, could, could I have a, an, an understanding of the process for arriving at this particular sum? Paul? Yep. So when the Integrated Joint Board was initially set up, there was a detailed piece of work done whereby the, the full council agreed the specific services to be delegated to the partnership and the, the budget was determined at that stage alongside that amount. So there was a kind of clear set of services and clear budget at that stage. What we do on an annual basis is we, we look at the additional costs that are impacting on delegated services, including uh, pay increases, non-pay increases and other, other pressures. But largely the approach taken by Scottish councils has been determined at a national level by the Scottish Government indicating that specific additional monies are included in the settlement for delegated social care services and effectively requiring councils to pass on their full share of those monies to the, the partnerships. So that's how we, this council, has determined the budget level for, for the IGB in recent years. And the assumption reflected in this paper is that that would continue to be the case. So we're continuing to work with our colleagues in the, the IGB on their budget challenge for, for next year. But the assumption we're reflecting in this paper is the one we've used in, in previous years, whereby it's the current year's delegated budget plus the full share of the additional monies being reflected in the settlement by the Scottish Government. Thank, thank you, Paul. Can I come again? Uh, thanks, Paul. That's very useful. So really, the Council has no control over this funding. It, it's not a negotiated. It's funding set out by the Scottish Government that the Council is more or less duty-bound to pass over, over to the Integrated Joint Board. That, that's largely, largely correct. I mean, at the end of the day, it is a Council decision what delegated budget is passed on to the partnership, but there are restrictions that are reflected in the settlement by the Scottish Government, so there's very little choice in that respect. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Councillor Jimison. Yeah, on page 23, 3.23, uh, 3 the revenue flexibilities, I, I know that's still under review at national and local level, but could you give us an understanding of the potential of that flexibility, given that we'll be setting in the budget in the next few weeks? Paul? So, obviously, there's quite a lot going on at a national level at the moment in relation to potential flexibilities. Uh, again, related to the pay negotiations last summer, there was a recognition of the, the pressures on councils and the Scottish Government at that stage indicated that one of the th that there was a kind of lack of money to support the enhanced pay offer. So one of the, the indications was that the, the restrictions on councils in terms of how they use the monies that are currently available were going to be lifted to an extent. There would be more flexibilities to councils to spend money where they determined it was it was required. Uh, obviously, that's led to a number of councils looking at particular savings in, in education and teachers as part of next year's budget setting and the Scottish Government have kind of intervened of late to limit the extent to which that might be taken forward by councils. So at this stage, that's still very much a kind of live, uh, high-profile national debate. So we're watching that very closely, but how that actually pans out will have a, an influence on what flexibilities we can look at going forward. I can't see anyone else looking to come in, so sorry, sorry, Councillor Dorward. Sorry, Chair, I was just reading some notes there. Thank you. Um, totally appreciate the, the challenges um, going forward and one of the things you said about supporting the COSLA lobbying position. And just for information, just a comment, the COSLA, COSLA budget SOS campaign in December 2022 highlighted the devastating impact 
on council services and communities for 2024. Um, due to an estimated funding gap across the whole of Scotland of one billion, um, unless more funding is provided for councils, which it doesn't look like it is given the, the response from Paul. And also I'd be quite concerned about we're looking for a, maybe an update on 3.4 um, in the paper on page 19. The Scottish Government has yet to announce a public sector pay policy for 23-24 at this stage. I know you've said there's no update on that yet in the paper. Has there any more information been provided? That's a no. <laughs> Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, just along the same lines as Linda has just uh, spoken of. Uh, and I know that Katie, through her role in COSLA, has featured heavily, or twice anyway, on the Sunday show, the pol political show in Scotland. But is there any uh, increased activity by the, the, the 32 local authorities in terms of a, a settlement uh, a, and maybe more activity, lobbying activity on uh, Holyrood from the council leaders, is there an appetite for that in terms of lobbying the Scottish Government because we are seriously affected in a poor settlement? Does any of the leaders know if there's any uh, future activities planned for local government? Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Scobie. In a previous role in attending COSLA, um, I do know that all 32 council leaders have sent a letter to the First Minister um, actually highlighting what I've just spoken about, the deficit in the budget. If I could give back, Chair, you know, and appreciate you know, the 32 authorities sending a letter, but you know, we've seen so many uh, public service uh, bodies uh, actually lobbying the, the, the Scottish Parliament the, at Holyrood. Is there any intention of uh, you know, organising that? This is not the officers, this is of the, the, the leaders of COSLA, if it's intended to do or, or enter into such activity. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, without me getting involved in the detail, because it wouldn't be appropriate at this point, I just wonder whether any of the press releases that are coming out from COSLA and following COSLA leaders, whether they should in fact be shared with all elected members across DNG, and that would give the most up-to-date information coming out of COSLA, because I understand that, well, I'm, a, I'm very well aware that there are updated press releases that come out regularly, and if members are maybe not seeing them or not getting them captured within the the members' bulletins that come out weekly to all elected members, perhaps they can be highlighted following the committee today. Thanks. I don't think there's the appetite coming over, <laughs> but you know it's maybe something that the council leaders can consider in terms of uh, the poor settlement and, and lobbying activities. Yep. Thank you. I don't think there's anyone else coming in. Isn't it? I can't see anyone else want to come in, so we move to the recommendations. Members are asked to one note the details of the local government. Finance Settlement 2023-24 is reflected at Appendix 1. To note the specific purposes for which funding has been allocated within the funding settlement as reflected at Paragraph 3.10. 3. Note that the Council's funding gap has been updated to reflect the impact of the Local Government Finance Settlement and the changes to the budget operating assumptions as detailed at Section 3.16 and 4. Note that the current projections reflected within this report may be subject to change as further information becomes available and as the Budget Bill progresses through the Scottish Parliament. Happy to know. We're just going to take a break for five minutes for the interpreter. Okay, thanks. Thank you.
Right, we'll resume on item number five, which is the further development of the capital investment strategy, report by Head of Finance and Procurement. This report develops the Council's current agreed capital investment strategy to reflect recent developments, including the announcement of the 2023-2024 local government finance settlement and updated projections of the future capital investment levels. Karen Donaldson and Paul Garrett are here to assist if any members have any questions, and I'll open up the meeting to member debate. Can't see anyone want to come in, so we'll move to the recommendations. Members are asked to one note that the 2023-24 local government's finance settlement announced on the 15th of December 2022 reflected a broadly cash flat position in relation to capital funding, which is in line with the previous assumption already reflected within the 10-year capital investment strategy. Two, note the updates to priority investment projects provided at Appendix 2. Three, note the impact of inflationary increases on the capital investment strategy reflected at paragraph 3.15 to 3.18 and that members may wish to allocate additional funding to the asset classes from 2024-25 onwards to offset the impact of inflation as part of their budget proposals. And four, note the development cost requirements for 2023-24 as detailed at paragraph 3.23 and appendix 3. And five, note that further support will be provided to members to support their considerations on the development of the 10-year capital investment strategy as part of the current budget setting process. So we're happy to note. Yeah. Moving on to item six, fiscal flexibility service concessions report by Head of Finance and Procurement. Members are provided with information on the service concessions fiscal flexibility, including the potential benefits that could be taken into consideration as part of members' budget setting considerations. Karen Donaldson and Paul Garrett are here to assist if members have any questions, and I'll open up the meeting to member debate. Can't see anyone come, want to come in, so we'll move to the recommendations. Members are asked to one note the flexibility available in relation to accounting for service concessions under Scottish Government Finance Circular 10 2022. Two note that the impact of the application of this flexibility would be as follows. Two point one note the spreading of charges to the council's revenue account for debt repayments on the schools PPP and Dalbiti Learning Campus. DBFM projects over the assessed useful economic lives of the schools 40 years rather than the contract terms of 30 years and 25 years respectively. 2.2 note a non-recurring increase in the general fund balances of £20.6 million. 2.3 note a reduction in annual charges to the council's revenue account which, when combined with the gradual release of this school's PPP sinking fund, would be £3.7 million per annum for 2023-24. And three, note the advice of the council... I'm so sorry to interrupt this as interpreter here. Could you slow down a little bit when reading the appendix? Sorry. That's all right. Sorry. Thank you. And three, note the advice of the council's head of finance and procurement regarding the potential application of this fiscal flexibility from financial year 2023-24, as summarised at paragraph 3.19. We're happy to note. Moving on to item number seven, the Council Revenue Budget and Monitoring Report 2022-23. For the period ended 31st of December 2022, quarter three, report by Head of Finance and Procurement. <coughs> Sorry. This report provides members with an overview of the Council's overall financial monitoring position for the current financial year as at 31st of December 2022. 
and the main financial pressures that are anticipated to impact on the Council's position, including the impact of pay and non-play inflationary cost increases. Gillian Ross and Paul Garrett are here to assist if members have any questions. And I'll open up the meeting to member debate. can't see anyone wanting to come in, so I'll move to the recommendations. Members are asked to note the updates I'm provided in relation to the 2022-23 pay award, negotiations on the extent of the inflationary increases impacting council services as noted in sections 3.3 to 3.8, to the protected service outturn positions provided in appendix 1, and the main areas of potential pressure set out within sections 3.10 to 3.15. Three, that this is currently forecast that the combination of the net loan charges, underspending and interest on revenue balances will be over £3 million in 2022 to 23, up from the figure of £1.7 million reported at the end of quarter two, due to recent increases in interest rate levels as reflected at sections 3.16 to 3.18 and four, the estimated financial impact associated with COVID-19 and cost of living as set out in Appendix 2, which will be funded from the resources set aside within service reserves as noted at section 3.20 and that members may wish to consider the allocation of the estimated remaining non-recurring allocated re resources of £1 million as part of their budget proposals. I'm happy to know. Moving on, item number eight, Finance and Procurement Revenue Budget Monitoring Report 2022-23 to for the period ended the 31st of December 2022. Members are provided with an overview of performance against budget for the period ending the 31st of December 2022 for finance and procurement. Gillian Ross is here to assist if members have any questions and I will open up the meeting to member debate. I can't see anyone wanting to come in, so we'll move to recommendations. Members are asked to note that the Finance and Procurement is forecast to deliver a balanced budget by the end of the financial year, based on the position as at the end of December 2022, excluding those costs that have been attributed to COVID-19 response and recovery detailed at Section 3.16. Moving on to item number nine, capital investment strategy monitoring 2022-23, quarter three. This report provides members with an overview of the financial and physical progress of the capital programme for the current financial year, based on the position as at 31st of December 2022. Issues in relation to the overall funding of the investment strategy and the progress of the approved programmes within that strategy are reflected in this report. Members will be aware that more detailed information on agreed projects within the approved programmes are reflected within the asset class reports presented to the relevant service committees. Karen Donaldson and Paul Garrett are here to assist if members have any questions and I'll open up the meeting to member debate. Councillor Hagman. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's it's in relation. So this is sort of the first report that we're actually being asked to agree because we have got so many noting reports um, and we're being asked to agree two pots of funding here that have already been via committee. It's more really a sort of uh, an admin request. So while we're being asked and they're referenced to the, both the ENR committee and the communities committee, 
in the past, we've actually had those committee reports as appendices, so members can fully read exactly what the funding is for. Now, I appreciate that, you know, in the paper, under background papers, there's a link to the to the agendas of those specific committees. They're not a link to the direct paper. And I think in future, it's really important that we can actually see a copy of those reports when we're looking to agree these, these allocations of budget. I know in the past, we always have had those reports. So I'm not quite sure why we haven't got that today, but I think it's important for future, um, for future committees. So if I can put that request forward, it'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hagman. That's noted. Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Chair. Um, nothing to do with the finances per se, but um, a point of 3.3 um, on page 123 talks about slippage reported across all areas of, of <clears throat> excuse me, across all areas of the capital investment strategy, which is concerning, but reflecting the challenging circumstances. Um, and I know that this is potentially um, a hangover from COVID and other things um, in terms of inflation, but in terms of the procurement process and supply chain issues, do we see any end to this or any improvement in this going forward? Thank you. Karen. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Dorwood. Um, yes, I think we are seeing improvement, and I think COVID did have a a significant impact on the programme and there was a lot of projects that um, was almost like stacked up and we're obviously trying to clear that backlog while taking forward new ones and certainly we've seen an improved position this year to the position we were in last year and we do uh, continue to, to, to see that improving and obviously um, officers are sort of planning in the, the known supply chain issues for example like the, the, the fleet service are already looking at next year's programme and, and, and ordering ahead just because they know the significant lead-in times for like buses and HGVs can be up to 18 months. So I think it's all about building in the supply chain issues into their project planning as well that will help it not have an impact so much on the delivery of the overall programme. Councillor Dorward. Thanks. That's reassuring because obviously a, a totally different approach to procuring in terms of learning from COVID and other things and, and, and timings. Um, it's reassuring for me as an elected member and also in terms of projects that will be shovel ready when you say they will be. So that's, that's good. Thanks very much for that. Councillor Scobie. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. My uh, remarks are referenced to 3.5 uh, in the paper that refers to the Stromna Flood Prevention Scheme. Uh, and I would hope that the uh, committee would uh, accept this uh, as added inflation, the 86,000 pounds that's needed to complete or, or the last piece in the jigsaw. This has been subject to delay after delay after delay. Uh, and I know it was uh, held back to purchase a, a piece of ground to, to cause a, a flood uh, a floodplain, but I would hope that the committee would support this, as I say, just to complete the whole thing. There are people living in fear, constant fear, every time it rains. Uh, you know, we've put in temporary measures, but I would hope the committee would support uh, the 86,000 needed to complete this job. Councillor Campbell. Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking for a wee point of clarity, if I may. Uh, page 124, table one, uh, where it's lists a number of properties that have been sold uh, in 310, 3.10. It says, uh, any capital receipts generated above the target of 500 will be transferred to the capital fund. Uh, I take it that's the total as opposed to just, uh, you know, there's a property there that's uh, 100,000. So it's everything that's been sold that will be above that 500 target. Thanks, Paul. See you on. Uh, and then it, this funding is uh, then can be used to support future ca capital expenditure or offset. So is that something that we can look towards, uh, you know, part of the budget setting as well? Thanks, Chair. Paul? Yes, absolutely. Uh, 
we, we actually have got an, an update on that figure as well. We, we've had a, a recent sale which has increased that. We've got further, I think we're over £900,000 for the current year now. So that is funding that's available to members to consider allocation going forward. Uh, if you recall, we, we've previously had surpluses that have gone into the capital fund and they've either been used to kind of offset shortfalls, but we've, we've pretty much been able to achieve the target in recent years. So one of the things that members did through this committee in August last year was use some of that money to support increased investment, particularly in the fleet uh, and transport assets. So that's maybe something we'd look at again. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Hislop. It's going back to Councillor Dorward's question. Is there any revenue impact with regard to the fact that we're not getting vehicles, computers, etc., into the system now? Because we built in some of our savings on the ground of it's cheaper to buy it than to hire it. If we're 18 months down the line, are we achieving those savings because we're still to hire the machine rather than get the new one uh, in place? So do we know if there's a revenue impact? It's, it's not something that's coming up as a significant issue through our monitoring. Uh, I mean, I think it, is, it will be the case that, you know, if we're, if we're maintaining old assets for a longer period, there'll be a maintenance cost associated with that, which will have some impact. But certainly we're, we're in regular discussion with the fleet manager. And uh, although there's kind of general pressures, inflationary pressures and other issues, that isn't coming up as a significant consideration in monitoring. But we'll look at it in a bit more detail, because it's a good point. Uh, but as I say, it's not something that's coming through as a major issue at this stage. I can't see anyone else want to come in, so we'll move to the recommendations. Members are asked to, one, note the financial and physical progress against the 2022-23 capital programme for the quarter ending the 31st of December 2022 as detailed at Appendices 1, 2 and 3. To agree the budget environment of up to £0 0.015 million pounds from the property building of their asset class to the public realm asset class in respect of the Langham War Memorial project as per paragraph 3.4. Three, agree the budget agreement of £0.086 million pounds from the public realm asset class to the Strand RAR flood protection scheme. <coughs> Sorry, as details at paragraph 3.5. And four, agree to the updated project development costs as reflected in Appendix 3 and paragraph 3. Point <coughs> Sorry, 1 1 to 3. Point one three. Happy, no, and agree two, three, and four. So we're going to adjourn again for the interpreter for five to ten minutes. Okay, thank you.
So we'll reconvene on item number 10, <coughs> which is the Procurement and Commissioning Structure and Resourcing Report. This report provides members with the recommended process to address the remaining actions from the Committee's review of the Council's financial procedures and procurement standing orders. Karen Scott and Paul Garrett are here to assist if members have any questions. I'll open up the meeting to member debate. Councillor Walters. Hi, can I just ask a question about, um, about the changes to the procurement uh, spending? I think it's probably page 149. Uh, the costings. Um, is there a, is there some sort of background as to why why we're talking about increasing the staff levels from uh, sort of eleven FTEs to sixteen FTEs? Because it seems like quite a, quite a lot of money to be spending uh, in this, and uh, I couldn't see the um, the sort of rationale be explained behind. I'm sure there's a link somewhere, but I couldn't see it. Karen. Yeah, thanks. So um, in terms of the background, um, the, the substantive budget, um, which is the 536,000 for the 11 FTA posts, um, was the pre-improvement project budget, which dated back to 2019. Um, since 2019, we've had um, over £1 million invested into the procurement um, arrangements across the Council. Um, and so as part of the FPT review that was undertaken in the procurement standing orders in 2020, there was a recognition that the, the previous arrangements um, we're not fit for purpose to deliver against a range of, of priorities for the procurement activities to be undertaken. Um, so the, the proposal at that point was that following project delivery, we would review the revised arrangements. So the current um, approved um, resourcing is at 20 FTE posts. Um, so the proposed um, recommendation is to reduce that down to 16 on a permanent basis um, to ensure that there's a continuous improvement um, agenda followed. Um, we continue to support supplier sustainability locally, deliver the community wealth building agenda um, and ensure value for money for um, all of the procurement spend within the council. Does that answer your question, Councillor Walters? I think it does, really. But so what you're saying is that it's a reduction from 20 FTE to 16. Karen? Is, is that what Karen's saying, yeah? The permanent budget allocation um, from revenue budget at the moment is for the living FT, but there's been um, additional funding made available on a temporary basis during the project delivery phase um, over the last two financial years, which has um, provided for the 20 FT um, resource arrangements to be made available for procurement. And so the recommendation on a permanent basis is to amend the revenue budget to accommodate the 16. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Hislop. Thank you, Chair. It's the 2.3, Karen. Um, the monies will be found from additional savings through procurement. Now, with inflation the way it's going, um, how are we going to guarantee that we will actually achieve those savings? Because you could say, right, we'll put in an inflation figure of 6%, only 5%, so that's a percent you've put on top to make sure you cover your uh, savings budget. How do we know that it's actually, there is a 255,000 saving from what's being procured, rather than we've put in a budget to cover that? Karen. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Hislop um, and Chair. So we're currently developing a savings programme which would look to achieve the overall savings target of five just over 500,000, um, and so we're looking for an element of that to be returned to enable that to be delivered. But you're, you're absolutely correct in, in the observation around the market challenges. So um, I, I recall back when um, life was a little easier in the procurement world, um, and we would expect to achieve procurement savings purely through competition and, 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 and did so in the past. Um, obviously, that, that, that's not an opportunity that we'd, we'd be seeking at this moment in time. So the savings programme that's been developed is looking much more around um, 
changing and, and reducing consumption, looking to reduce the demands, can we reduce frequencies of how often we do certain things, um, for um, example in service contracts, looking at where we can um, maximise rebates as well, so can we do things and change the, 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 the way our contracts are constructed to maximise rebates that we receive, again looking at some of the payment terms as well, um, if we're paying by purchase card for example, we can make significant rebates for some of our larger values of spend through that. Um, and there's, there's um, a national programme that we're piloting at the moment through Scotland Excel, which will look at some product swaps for, for certain things. So moving from branded to non-branded, for example, um, or more environmentally um, friendly um, opportunities there as well. So a range of different ideas at the moment. Councillor Hislop. Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Karen, for the report. Um, in terms of 3.5 on 136, so spending additional financing on whole time equivalent staff seems a reasonable project pro prospect. A couple of questions on 3.5 um, yeah. highlights there's a high demand for procurement professionals and a general shortage of available expertise, which seems to be a growing trend in, in various specialist um, professions across um, local authorities. Now, that's challenging in the first place. Um, and you're talking about um, having recruiting new, largely inexperienced staff, apologies for reading most of this out loud, at junior levels alongside securing more experienced officers. Um, in terms of the, the improvements you want to make to the procurement service and <coughs> And in terms of governance and assurance, is that the right way forward? You know, how, what's the sort of balance there? And how much support will these inexperienced people get? And two, two questions, sorry, maybe three questions. Um, is this sustainable um, over the, the medium term? And are there any other plans in terms of workforce planning and training for the future? I think that's enough for the moment. Thank you. Karen. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Dorwood. Um, in terms of the, the, the narrative within 3.5, that's, that's kind of the journey we've been on over the last couple of years, where we have obviously experienced um, some real challenges around bringing in that, that mix of skills. Um, we have um, secured three permanent, te uh, three temporary team leaders, um, which come with a range of um, experience and qualifications into the team. Um, they are all um, working proactively at the moment with a number of trainees, um, and that's that's working really well. They're all um, appearing to be incredibly motivated and in, enjoying the job that they're doing. We've continued to provide an opportunity to work flexibly with the home working, um, which obviously the, the rural nature, the three team leaders that have been brought in, all live out with the region unfortunately so um, the home working they're, they're able to have a hybrid model where they come in and spend maybe a day or two a week with the trainees and then work remotely the rest of the time so that's that's something that's actually been um, working very well in terms of being able to attract and retain some more experienced staff um, which was not an opportunity we had previously um, the trainees that we have had in have all been progressing through levels and we've been we've been working with the, the trainee model for around four or five years and um, so we've actually seen some of them become qualified and, and be promoted up within as well so and um, we've got obviously some newer trainees in so the intention with the proposal is that it allows us to continue with that grow our own but obviously having an expanded structure on a permanent basis gives gives that security because i guess ultimately at the moment the majority of members of that team um, are on temporary contracts just related to the current funding arrangements Councillor Yeah, at page uh, 136, um, 3.4, the th fourth bullet point, I see training obviously is a really important aspect of this, but I also note including training for elected members, which again I think is really quite crucial. Uh, in terms of that ongoing training and succession, you know, with an elected body, it would, it would seem pertinent to make sure that that training, there's overlaps. Because, you know, from my own experience, being a new guy, understanding all this stuff is really critical. So I think training for elected members, even alongside some of the professionals, I think would be really helpful going forward. Thank you. Karen. 
Yeah, agreed, and, and completely understand the value in that as well. We did run um, just pre the elections um, a, a, a formal session specifically for elected members, and we agreed at that time that we would rerun that session. So we, we just need to get a, a suitable time and date in the diary to do that, and we'll continue to refresh that throughout as well. Thanks, Karen. I can't see anyone else want to come in, so we'll move to the recommendation. Members are asked to, one, agree the criteria set out within Appendix 1 of this report for returning delegations to services for low-value procurement activity. Two, agree the revised structure of the Council's procurement and commissioning team as reflected at Appendix 3 to this report. Three, agree that the increased annual cost of the revised structure of 255k per annum be funded to the identification of additional procurement savings through a procurement efficiencies and savings programme and four agree to receive a progress report on both the establishment <coughs> of the revised business as usual procurement team structure and on the progress of the procurement efficiencies and savings programme towards the end of the 2023-24 financial year. Happy to agree. So moving on to item 11, so procurement and commissioning performance update, financial year 2022-2023, quarter two. This report provides an overview on the key procurement activities delivered during the second quarter of 2022-2023, this report is intended to highlight to members key issues, risks and successes relating to procurement activity during this time and provides details of recent events held for local suppliers. Karen Scott and Paul Garrett are here to assist if members have any questions and I'll open up the meeting to member debate. Councillor Hagman. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's in relation to the um, appendix on page 157. Um, we've got performance indicators within there with the targets quarter one, quarter two and year to date. I think it would be really helpful in future reports and appreciate that we've we've only started to sort of gather some of this data, having been aware when we started on this procurement journey, we discovered that a lot of local authorities have never benchmarked some of this information. However, it would be really useful if we can get the previous year's um, targets or the previous year's um, data. So we've got something to compare. I appreciate we're not going to be able to have all that immediately, but for again, for future reports, if that can be captured, because that would really allow us a chance to see have we improved, are, are we have we not improved, or are we just at the same positions? So it's a request for future reports regarding performance indicators. Thank you. Karen. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Hagman. Um, that's absolutely not a problem. Um, one of the my, my only challenge might be how we present some of it because some of the indicators have been refined slightly. Um, but we've, we've certainly got benchmark data that can can be included for previous financial years to show um, that comparison. I will include that for the quarter three report going forward. Thanks, Karen. Councillor Hislop. Thank you, Chair. It's with regard to the Meet the Buyer event. Um, there were 578 suppliers, 239 actual attendees, 105 of these were unique businesses, and seven were from Dumfries and Galloway. Is it the case that where the event was held wasn't good for Dumfries and Galloway or for the rest of the sort of businesses when you've got about a fifth, you know, under a fifth turning up from who actually wanted to go um, and do we need to look at other locations um, to actually see if we can get that attendance up? And although it says 578 suppliers pre-registered, how many of those were from Dumfries and Galloway? Was it just the seven? 
And is that an issue that we need to look at as well to try and get people to actually come along and say, well, we want to be part of Team DG? Karen. Yeah, thanks. So in terms of the, this event, um, obviously this was the South of Scotland event, um, which had a significantly lower number of DNG businesses um, representing than we would have certainly hoped for. And when we do the comparison to the, the Dumfries event as well, which was held a couple of months earlier, obviously that had a much um, greater um, attendance from DNG businesses with actually it almost being the kind of reverse in terms of the percentage statistics of attendance that the majority of businesses that attended the Dumfries, um, Dumfries and Galloway Dumfries event um, wa was actually DNG businesses. So um, I do think the location, um, obviously at Selkirk, does, does make it quite difficult. I think the south of Scotland um, as a whole, there's, there's not a huge amount for us in between ourselves and, and borders. So the intention from that event was to make it an annual event, but with the location alternating in between the two regions each year. So um, the, the, the first event was obviously held and hosted within the borders. So um, an event this year would be held within the DNG area. Um, looking potentially either at Dumfries, Lockerbie or Moffat, um, which would obviously still give that ease of access for, for those coming from the borders. Um, we'll continue to have our own DNG event as well as the South of Scotland event. Um, and we're also working up at the moment some further events which actually target specific sectors. Because um, I again recognise there's perhaps some sectors who feel that the larger um, meet the buyer isn't, isn't something they recognise or, or, or would, would feel was appropriate to them. Um, so we're, we're also going to be doing some targeted specific events around um, certain sectors where we're, we're having challenges to, to get interest in some of our contract areas as well. Thanks, Karen. I can't see anyone else want to come in, so we'll move to the recommendations. Members are asked to note the update on the Council's procurement performance and activities during quarter two. 1st of July 2022 to the 30th of September 2022 of this financial year as detailed in appendices 1 and 2 of this report. I'm happy to note. Okay, so item number 12 is any other business deemed urgent by the Chair. I've not been notified of any urgent business. So can I thank members for their contribution today and I'll bring this meeting to a close. Thank you.